before we begin, maybe I could just uh, pray again and ask for God's help, okay? So let's pray. God, uh, we thank you, God, for your words and just for today. And we, we pray, God, that your spirit would, would help us. It would teach us, God. It would bring to remembrance all that you have said, uh, Jesus, our Lord, all your words for us. So, God, I pray that you would uh, be in my words and be in the words on the screen and just, just serve and serve us, God, and minister to us with your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Um, so as a quick recap of last week, uh, we talked about uh, Genesis 15. We talked about God uh, setting up a covenant ceremony, right? The ancient Hebrew covenant ceremony. You cut up the animals, you know, you line them up. And there's a covenant agreement, right, between God and Abraham. And instead of Abraham walking down the aisle, um, the Spirit of God walks down the aisle and seals the covenant promise. So in other words, God is the promise maker and the promise keeper. He he does all that he says he will do. That is, it is God's word. It is God's promise. It is his covenant loyal commitment to himself and to Abraham and all of Abraham's offspring, right? And so that it was very significant that the spirit of God would, you know, go down that aisle to seal, to, 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 to seal God's promise and his commitment to his people, okay? So, and then he makes an argument, just as a reminder, he says, well, the covenant came first, and then 430 years later, the law came through Moses. And, but, but God was, it was all about the promise, right? The law came later. It was all about the covenant promise. So then Paul, in the next four verses or so, is basically addressing the argument, well, then why do we need the law? Like, what's the purpose of the law? Why, why did God do that? If, if it was really all about his promise and his commitment pointing to Jesus Christ, right, who fulfills that promise, what was the purpose of the law? Because remember, the Jewish readers and the Jewish listeners, they're all about the law, right? The law from Moses, so what's the purpose? They're, they're, now they're confused, you know, and maybe we're confused. Well, God, why, why, what's the point of the law, right? Because the law was a big deal. Um, so Paul addresses that, okay? So let's, let's read. I'm going to read uh, 19 through 22 first and then just kind of come back to, to 19 and 20. Why then the law? It was added because of transgression, okay? That's the part we're going to focus the most on here. It was added because of transgressions, because of sin. Until the, so, so it was temporary in a sense, right? It, it had a purpose in that time period until the offspring, Jesus Christ, should come to whom the promise had been made. And it, the law, was put in place through angels by an intermediary or a mediator, which is Moses, right? The Mosaic law, he's the mediator, right? Now, an intermediary implies more than one, but God is one. We'll come back to that, okay? Is the law then contrary to the promises of God? So this is the second question that Paul is trying to address. So the first question is, what's the point of the law? And then the second question is that he's trying to answer is, well, is the law in direct conflict with God's promise? Like, how, how does it work together, right? Is it supposed to work together? 
Is the law then contrary to the promises of God? Certainly not, is what Paul says. For if a law had been given that could give life or eternal life, then righteousness would indeed be by the law. But the scripture imprisoned everything under sin, imprisoned everything under sin, so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. All right, so that's, those are the four verses. Let me, let me come back, though. <clears throat> um, so I'm just going to kind of quickly go through this, but um, Romans, Paul talks about this more in Romans, but God, if I had to summarize this part, it was added because of transgression. The law, God gave the law to define expose and penalize sin. That's why God gave the law. So let me, let me set up this example, okay? So <clears throat> if Genesis 15, that covenant commitment was like a marriage ceremony, okay? If it was a marriage ceremony between God and his people, right? Because God talks about how he's the groom and the church is his bride. The people are the bride of Christ, right? If that was the marriage ceremony, okay, what happened was uh, the, the bride, us, kept preferring other things. So we agreed to the marriage, right, with God, but we kept, our eyes kept, you know, going to other places, right? We were married to God, but we were unhappy with God. So we kept going to these other things, right? So God in the Old Testament, continuously calls his people adulterers. He says, you adulterous people with adulterous hearts just can't stop. You can't be satisfied with God, so you look to other things, right? So what he's saying is the law, God gave the law so that you would know line by line in all the elements of the law that you are sinning. You are straying from God. You are straying from your husband you're straying from your spouse, and you are looking and preferring other things. That's the reason why God gave the law. Okay? That's what Paul's saying. Until, so it was, it was meant to be, actually next week, we'll, we'll, uh, the next set of verses, Paul goes into this a little bit further. He calls the law a guardian, actually. The, the law was guarding us, right? Um, until the offspring, until Jesus Christ should come and do what? ratify that marriage in a different way. The new covenant, right? There's a new covenant, which I'm going to talk about here in a second. So it was, so that marriage ceremony was kind of like part one. It was like not really complete because the problem was that the spouse, us, we just, we're too busy with other things. We preferred other things over our spouse, God, right? So, until Jesus Christ should come, and it was put in place through an angel by Moses, an intermediary. Um, I don't want to spend a lot of time on verse 20, but just in case, it's because it's a little confusing. Now, an intermediary implies more than one, but God is one. All he's saying is that in a legal sense, a mediator sits between two parties, right? But what he's saying is kind of using some poetic language, right? Paul's saying but God is one. He's trying to make it all one. He's not trying to create a distance through a mediator between him and his people. God wants it to be one, okay? So let's keep going. Is the law then contrary to the promises of God? So then, okay, then if God gave the law, right, and it was meant to define, expose, and penalize all of our sin against God, all of our preference for other things, over our lover and our maker, God, then like, how does that work with the promise that he gave us, right? Does it, is it like in conflict? Does it contradict? Because remember, the Jews care a lot about the law, right? As, as they should. And he says, certainly not. For if the law had been given that could give life, then righteousness would indeed be by the law. It's, it's kind of like going back to the marriage example, okay? I remember when I first got married, 
and I read this book. I read a book. I actually don't remember what the name of the book was. Uh, it was something about like, basically it was like how to be a, a better husband. <laughs> it was like how to be a godly husband. And I was reading this book and it was very practical. It was listing out all these things, go on date nights and do the dishes and like, you know, listen and like, you know, like serve and you know, all these things, right? So it's, it's just like this checklist of all these things. But you know what? Reading that book did not make me a good husband. I'm just gonna be honest. <laughs> reading that book, just doing all that stuff, right? Didn't make me a good husband, right? I, I, I'm not a great husband now, but like that in and of itself, reading checklists and rules in and of itself does not make you a great husband. That's what he's saying. The law was given to, to define sin, but going through the law doesn't make you a lover of God, okay? But, so that was, it was intentional. God used the scriptures to imprison, right, us under that sin, right? To be, to, to basically kind of be, in a sense, you know, distraught with how, like, we just can't help ourselves, God. I just can't help it. That's a wonderful confession. God, I can't help it. I love you, but I just can't help it, right? I just can't help looking around and being distracted. What a wonderful confession, right? So that, and here's like the good news, so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. So let me, let me quickly, I'm running out of time here, let me quickly read a couple verses that um, show uh, and many of you might know these verses, but it's from the Old Testament, and it's God pointing out that that marriage ceremony with Abraham was just the start. Jesus Christ was going to fulfill it all, okay? So this is from Ezekiel 36, 25 to 28. This is God's promise, okay? He's, he's alluding to Jesus Christ. He's saying that covenant before was just the start. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to complete, fully complete that covenant. This is what God says. I will sprinkle clean water on you. So God's going to do it. God's going to clean you. All of that distraction, all of that preferring other things, that sin that the law exposed, God's like, I'm going to clean you. And you shall be clean from all your uncleannesses. And from all your idols, I will, clean, uh, I will cleanse you. God promises that he will cleanse us from all of our other preferences, right? And, and this is it, this is like what happens through Jesus Christ, right? I will give you a new heart. I will give you a new heart. That old heart it can't do it, right? That old heart can't, <laughs> can't stop, right? So Jesus has to put that old heart to death through the cross and give us a new heart. That's the gift, right? The gift of God through the Holy Spirit is a new heart and a new spirit I will put in you. And I will remove that hard heart of stone from your flesh and give you a soft heart of flesh. I will put my spirit in you. We talked about this a couple weeks ago, the gift of the Holy Spirit. God promised that in the Old Testament. I will give you, right, put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. He's going to cause us to love him. You know, the greatest, love God with all your heart. And you shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers. You shall be my people and I will be your God. So let me just quickly as I wrap up, go back, okay? So Paul's point here is that Okay, sin, I'm sorry, the law, God gave the law. It's like when I read that book, it's like, wow, I'm not a great husband, right? <laughs> like, it's like it was just exposing the fact of how terrible of a husband I was, right? And, but the thing is, that book in and of itself, those checklists did not make me a great husband. It could only be through faith in Jesus Christ. God has to do it. God has to give you a new heart that makes you a lover of God. And that's his promise, that's his promise in the cross. That's his promise in the resurrection. God is, that word, sanctification, he is making you 
holy so that you are like God. You love God and you want to be one with God. So that's the promise, and it's not in the law. It's in Jesus Christ. Okay, let's pray. God, uh, thank you, God. We just, uh, we come, and as we come into your word and into your presence, God, I just, I pray, God, we would, we would know you more. God, we, we want to repent, turn away from our, our other things, God, the other things that distract us. Thank you for your promise in Jesus Christ, God, the promise of the new heart, the promise of your spirit, the promise of your cleansing, the promise that you're going to cause us to love you and obey you, God, and, and, and we're just going to, we're going to dwell with you, we're going to be with you, God. So I just pray, God, now that we would, we would uh, be, just feel the privilege, God, of, of your grace and your love in our lives. God, thank you. God, help us today. Continue to minister to us as we, as we come into your presence, God. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.